Hi guys, it's Friday. It is September 22nd, 2017. This video is for those who are really hurting. It's for those who have been abandoned by your own family. It is for the unwanted. It is for those who are in desperate need of help and your families are turning their backs and boy, in the recent videos that I've been posting, I can't believe how many of you are experiencing this. It is extremely painful. And when you are in desperate need of help, or you've lost so much, and you have been essentially just thrown away like garbage. It is, it is so hard to comprehend how your own family can treat you the way many of you have left comments saying that you've been treated. It's very, very hard to comprehend that your own mother, the woman who actually gave birth to you, can not care at all, at all, about what you're going through. Walk away from you at a time that you really need their help. Your mother's help, your siblings' help, your father's help. You know, I was thinking about those years when I was much younger in my early 20s, even 30s, even 40s. I never could fully grasp what I came from. And Scott Peck actually says in this book that people will remain children, even as adults. They will remain children. They will not fully mature until they can finally admit to themselves and speak out loud that that evil that they came from. And he's focusing on malignant narcissism. And I never really understood that until, I don't know, 55 years of age. That's how long it took me to finally get, okay, um, it is what I'm coming from. It is what I came from. It is what I live. And it is what I've lived for 58 years. And based on a lot of the comments that I'm reading, I can say that it is what a lot of my subscribers, you guys, are living, what you came from. And it is exceedingly painful. I ran away from recognizing or allowing myself to acknowledge how thoroughly unwanted I was for most of my life. Now, that is easily understood considering that nobody wants to feel unwanted, but you certainly don't want to feel unwanted by your own mother, your own sister, your own brother. Um, but I had so much in my life I had a life, I had meetings to go to, I had access to resources, you know, to keep me busy, to, um, to not look at it. And when something happens to your life, and suddenly you're stripped of those resources, and you are in so much need of help, and you no longer have access to those resources to keep you busy, to, to um, distract you from reality, from the truth. That's when the pain becomes so intense that it can really kind of cripple you. And I know that a lot of you understand what I'm saying because of 
what I have read, you sharing your experiences with me. And I am so sorry that many of you are, are in need. And you're struggling. And you're not only dealing with the practical that you struggle with, that you need help with, not only dealing with you know the physical pain, uh, not only dealing with the medical issues that you need help with, but you're also dealing with the emotional pain of recognizing that the people who should care about you, the people that should love you, the woman who gave birth to you, brought you into this world, that they literally don't care. It's hard to fully grasp that. And I completely understand. And I was also thinking, you know, that if I had not lived the experience that I have lived all my life, and certainly now live 24-7, can't get away from it, and had not heard from so many people living a similar experience, I probably wouldn't even believe it. I might be one of those who say, well, yeah, okay, they might be exaggerating, and I might even think, well, maybe they are uh, wanting somebody to take care of them. Maybe they are somebody who um, really can pick themselves up. But you know, they're lazy. All of the judgments that you hear from people who have not lived this experience. And I was also thinking about. You know, decades ago when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s even, when I was still in denial, still in denial that I actually did come from this, I was still unable to accept some of those stories that I heard from people. Even those stories that matched mine, but those stories that didn't match mine, that were outside of mine, and far more horrific, those, I, I just assumed that people were exaggerating. And I think that comes about when you're hearing something that resonates with you, but you don't want to acknowledge it. So you've got to push it away. And one of the ways in which we push it away is by judging somebody and judging them as they're not really telling the truth. And then when you get out of your denial, when you finally accept the horror of what you grew up in, that's when you start believing other people fully. I will tell you that it is heartbreaking to know so many of you are really struggling and so many of you have had your families betray you. Um, I understand that the family has been broken. There are very few families that are actually intact and healthy. There are many families that are intact, but they're not healthy. They live lifetimes of dysfunction without ever resolving it to actually be able to live having relationships that are really fabulous, you know? trusting relationships among family members and where you're excited to go, you know, see them because you haven't seen them throughout the year, so you're excited about going for Christmas or Thanksgiving. I, I don't hear from anybody who's excited about seeing their family over the holidays. 
it's a very, very sad reality that we live here in our country. But when, when we have so much going on now, when we have so many people who now have very serious diagnoses, medical issues, when we have people losing jobs left and right and they can't find other work, when we have people losing their homes, when we have these disasters, you know, where homes are flooded, when we have people going homeless, children, grandchildren, that's when you get to recognize that something's very wrong in our country. Very wrong. I want to tell you, um, when I was posting on Irma, and I did make mention in a couple of videos that my mother lives in Naples. And I was remembering back in, I think, 2011 or maybe 12, I can't remember. But there was a storm that was coming um, into Naples off the, uh, off the Gulf. And I was still concerned about my mother. She's your mother. And I was calling and calling and calling and she finally picked up the phone and I said, are you okay? And she said, yes, I'm in the bathtub. I've got my flashlights. I'll be fine. All right. Now, she lived in a condo uh, smack on the Gulf. So, when the storm left, there were power outages, and I was calling and calling, and there was no way to get through. I was worried about my mother. And it was at a time when she was doing something really <laughs> pretty extraordinary to me, got me into this really twisted manipulation that left me homeless, that got me into the circumstance that I live today. And there I am, wanting to make sure that she was okay. I couldn't get through, couldn't get through for days, and then finally I got through. Every time she answered the phone and heard my name, heard my voice, her tone would change from the hello to hi, Carol, with such utter contempt. But I said, how are you? I'm fine. I found out that she had called everybody in the family to tell them that she was fine but not me. And I found out, because I asked, I said, how did you call? There, there were power outages. She said, I have a cell phone. I didn't know that. I didn't have the telephone number. So when Irma was making its way to Naples, and I'm posting, and I'm posting on Naples, and I'm thinking, about my mother, and I'm not saying anything, but I'm feeling something. But what I was feeling was this amazing sadness because I really didn't feel anything for her. I had no worry. And in fact, I'll admit, I didn't care. Now, um, <clears throat> what was the change? Well, when you have a mother that has done things deliberately to destroy your life, to ruin your reputation, everything that you've worked for, never acknowledged. She has a fa fabricated story about how you are a violently mentally ill drunk it hurts so that's the malignant narcissism that can do that and then the flying monkeys the siblings 
that know that she's lying. They maintain that lie. And it literally does destroy your life. And you begin to live something so surreal, but so incredibly painful, that it is... You do finally get to a point where Well, you're not hating them and you don't want revenge and very often you actually feel sorry for them to I mean I can't I can't fathom my own mother, my own brother, my own sister. I can't fathom living as they do. I can't figure it out. I can't get into that kind of mindset. And I know that my older brother and older sister certainly have lived their own issues, never clearing them up, so um, they've never been able to grow and mature and really get to know who they are. So they live in the same familial dynamic. They live the past with the present and what a waste of life, you know, to, to go through it and to not do the work necessary to really fully get to a place where, wow, you know who you are, you, firm, you, you, you stand firm, and you resolved a lot of the past, so you don't have to hang on to it. A lot of people get confused. They're thinking, I'm living in the past. No, I live the present. I live the destruction presently, every day. So, and, and to live having, having to keep somebody down so that you can feel good about yourself. and to never ever recognize a member of your family for everything that they have done in their life and to never recognize that they're the scapegoat the youngest in the family actually did become an adult accomplished quite a lot change significantly to know that they literally cannot acknowledge that. So you're treated like you're this nine-year-old kid who's constantly getting into trouble. And everything is about maintaining that narcissistic dynamic because the malignant narcissist rules over your sister and brother. She controls them. And they can't get out of that. And you heard enough throughout your adult life to kind of put those pieces together and figure it out. But it's... Um, it's very... It's very... It's I, I can't even really describe how I'm feeling about not feeling anything about my own mother with Irma, you know, and she's living in Naples. And my hunch, you know, she's got the money to um, have prepared. Um, she's got my sister who, no doubt, you know, I can't say for sure because I'm, I'm not part of the family and I don't get to know anything, but... My hunch is that my sister probably, you know, was concerned and she, if my mother couldn't, you know, do the things necessary to get to a place of safety, then my, my sister might have put it together or my brother. So... It's not the lack of care now that I have. It's not about 
any kind of hatred. It's not about any kind of, you know, I've never wanted revenge. I've just wanted help. But I, I do think often about their lives and to have lived so stuck in their own issues from their own childhoods. I mean, and to never grow beyond it. And we know that narcissists, the pathological, the bona fide, we know that they can't ever look at themselves. We know that they can't ever accept responsibility for anything. Um, and we know that they think that they're perfect. So, uh, unfortunately, they get to live a life that they're so filled with so many issues. And they are really, ugh, you know, they have to maintain um, at all costs an appearance that is not real. They have to maintain this theater that they've got going that's not real. Can you imagine living like that? I can't. Um, they have to make sure. I mean, I would think it would be exhausting. What my mother has done, what my mother has done, I mean, this, this fabric, fabricated story that she's got going, that she has had going for, well, when you do the work, if you're the scapegoat, then I'm sure if you've done the work, you'll understand when I say that when you finally get that, oh my God, you have been lied about, the family is lying about you, and you dig a little deeper and you go, they've been lying a lot longer than you realize. That takes a lot of energy to maintain that story, to make sure that the scapegoat never ever uh, exists for anybody. So you've got to keep them very, very isolated. So they, well, in my case, you know, this is all I know. I, they won't actually tell me, you know, what all of the lies were. My sister-in-law once stayed with me in Northampton, Massachusetts. She had a, a writing conference and she came up, stayed with me. We went out to dinner and she said, um, oh my God, you should hear what your sister and mother say about you. And I would hear these things. Now, I hardly ever saw my family throughout my entire adult life. But in these instances of, hey, you know, it's been 10 years, but there would be things said and I would be, I think, shell-shocked. And I couldn't even respond. I couldn't respond to my sister-in-law then. I couldn't say, what are they saying? I just, well, you're the scapegoat. You've always been treated like trash. You've always been, um, you know, the one who is held in contempt. So I think at that moment, I might not have wanted to know. But then you get back into your life and you forget about it. And then you have the experience where you really need their help. And then it starts. You find out how vicious they have become. They make sure that you never succeed again. You can't figure things out. So you're left like, what the hell is going on? People are responding to you in a way that you're like, why are they responding this way? Your life literally just falls into this why do, why is my channel named Kafka? 
Winston world because The Trial is my favorite book and I relate to Mr. K. He being accused and nobody will tell him what he's being accused of. So he, you know, the, 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 the brilliance of the book is just the writing and how surreal, you know, you get into Mr. K's life and the, the, the utter absurd surreal experiences that he has trying to figure out what he's been accused of and that became my life from 2002 to this day and I had those remarkable moments of going oh my god everything that they're saying about me is what they are not me but how many years did you hold on to that? How many years did you believe that message about you? How many years did you have at your core that you were worthless and unwanted and so disgusting that you should not even be invited to anything? And then you get intellectually that you're not that person but it's still at your core. And I'm saying that because of a message that I read just this morning from a subscriber who fortunately broke away from that kind of treatment from his family and I'm glad you did. Nonetheless, it's very hard to recover, you know, and and to deal with all of these issues that you are left with, you know, when when you have a family that has treated you like trash your entire life, it's like, okay, uh, you got a lot of issues. But I understand that it comes from them, not me. It doesn't say anything about me. It says everything about them. And I understand that <clears throat> our past can be the thing that controls us and we never really get to live in the present we never really get to know who we are authentically unless we do the work to resolve all of those issues from the past unless we really spend an awful lot of time self-reflecting and examining our past and if you can't do it then you're kind of like this controlled this programmed robot who will go through life never knowing what they could have been and that is incredibly sad to me for them but it was truly the, when I finally got that, wait a second here, you've done all of this work, you know all of what you have resolved, um, all of the issues that you had were related to your past. Of course, the issues that my sister and brother have, my mother has, related to their past. And it leaves you in a place where you, there is not all the time because I do have to live the consequences of, of their issues. But there, are, there have been many times when I've had great compassion actually for my mother um, in particular I don't like the fact that my sister and brother actually know that my mother is lying, but they they can't, they're still the children who can't break away and do what's right, so they just follow along as children do. But I but I really understand that something horrific happened to my mother because if she grew up in a healthy, caring, loving home, 
I think she would have been an incredible, really fabulous person. But whatever happened to her, um, she couldn't break through. She couldn't um, do what was necessary to really become her own self. Instead, clearly the trauma and the shame had such a hold on her that you know she became that malignant narcissist I'm sorry for hesitating so often and the noise from the neighbor's car but um, it is very sad to me because I really do think that life we need to take it seriously and when we don't do that kind of work on ourselves to really kind of re-examine our beliefs, our values, to uh, reevaluate them, to, to do that work necessary to really get to our authentic selves, um, then it kind of, to me, life is really nothing. Um, it's just about doing, you know, the nine to five job and, you know, trying to be a success and then trying to be more uh, of a success than your neighbor or your siblings or somebody so that you can outdo them and getting all of this material stuff and, you know, the, the consumerism and, you know, having that second home and thinking that you're, you know, what? Thinking that you're what? Doing all of that. What does it mean? kind of wish they would turn off the radio but um, so what does it mean what does it mean um, especially when you're living lives where you're lying you know you're maintaining a pretense where you can't be honest with people in your own life um, and you end up hurting other people and, so many people clearly have just said, well, you know, they make up these stories in their own heads about people who uh, are in need of help and they think, well, they're just lazy or they are uh, not thinking positively enough or all of the bullshit. Well, they've made their own bed or we all create our own reality and too bad for you that you need help. You need to create a reality where you don't need help. It's so warped and twisted. And I mean, if life is to mean anything, it's through our connection with one another. And if relationship is to mean anything, then it has to be honest. And so for all of the people out there with their issues about lying and not not standing accountable for what they do to other people, um, people who get really defensive or uh, have to be right, their issues trump their care for that person that they're in relationship with and that relationship really um, it's not a healthy one it's not an honest one and my god you know if life if this is the only one we have man don't you want it to be something really meaningful don't you want it to be something that while you may not have answers to the big questions and I know that a lot of Christians do a lot of people who you know are religious they have those answers um, but 
those of us, you know, who have not been able to, you know, come to any answers, then it's really important to have healthy relationships with people because that's where joy comes from. That's what gives us connection. That's the substance of life. But much of what we have created here in the United States is, well, consumerism, materialism, and showing off, acting, acting, thinking that we're, you know, uh, better than because we drive a Mercedes and live in a mansion and you know, wear designer clothing, and we look good when we're older. We have the money to, you know, get rid of some of those wrinkles. And and it's all just bloody meaningless. If the individual living that kind of life can't be honest, can't be truly who they are, doesn't have genuinely loving, caring, honest, healthy relationships. And I, look, I've known a lot of people in my life, so I can tell you there's not an awful lot of people out there that can have an honest relationship. Um, because of their own upbringings that leave them, you know, filled with shame. And, um, and it's not just our families, you know, we, we have been inculcated, you know, culture. What is our culture here in America? It's, it's buy, 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 you know, get a more expensive car, get a bigger house. And that's pretty empty. But when you grow up in families that, you know, doesn't have to be those of us outside the bell curve, you know, with these horrific stories, but the majority coming from these dysfunctional homes, you know, love is conditional. Very few parents can love unconditionally. And how are you raised? You're raised to be a successful adult. What does a successful adult mean in America? It means you better get a job where you can get a lot of money. That's it. Now, how much is really spent on developing a child's moral character and helping that child, you know, establish really good principles and then helping that child, encouraging that child to live those principles, very few come out of those families. So we do have an awful lot of adults who live a complete pretense because they, they need to get the approval and they have to act like everybody else in order to get that approval. And they can't really um, ever uh, individuate from the social network because, well, my God, if you have a different opinion and, and, uh, and your individual self means that you're going to be living a different way, then, yeah, there's an awful lot of Americans who have a fear of abandonment. So they just go along to get along because, because <laughs> they know what the abandonment feels like because that comes from the conditional love that they felt when they were growing up. They don't want to feel that again. So they live their lives just not ever really being genuine. <coughs> you know, they just do things in order to oof, never get any kind of backlash from anybody. Never have anybody, you know, confront them. 
And a lot of that pretense, well, then they get kind of buried in lies and then manipulations and so it's, you know, And how do I know this? Because I've lived it. Because I've lived it. And it might be true that the only way that one can actually understand, fully understand, get it in your soul, um, what I am saying is if you have that kind of life-changing experience that you didn't die from, that you didn't become an alcoholic and drug addict and then kill yourself. If you were able to to really assess what has happened and you do go through that, you know, Reevaluation and self reflection, and you know, suddenly you are perceiving the world differently, and and your view changes, and your opinions change, and everything changes about you. If you don't have that kind of experience, then then I think it's impossible for people to understand that they are not who they think they are. And when you do have this kind of experience, and when you have done the work to resolve some of those issues from your past, it does bump you up to a level of consciousness where you begin to see very easily how disintegrated Americans are. How they speak things about themselves that they never live and how they are operating on a level of ego that they can't really have a healthy relationship because it's based on ego. So they're in this relationship with you, but there's a lot of lies and manipulations and stories told that aren't true because they want you in their life and they want your approval. They can't just simply be who they are. So, when you do do that work, all of those issues that people have become very, very clear to you. Very clear. And with some, you know, people that you really care about, you want them to do the work. You so want them to stop lying. You just want them to stop the manipulation, you know, and you get to a certain point where you really need for people to be honest, to stop playing the games. And you find out how few there are that can actually do that. So, I think a lot of you, based on the comments and the messages, emails that I've gotten from a lot of you, I think a lot of you will relate to what I'm saying. And I feel badly about that because this is not the way life should be. You know, it could have been incredible. It could have been so unbelievably incredible if people would just stop lying. Just that in itself. Just stop lying. My God. Let us have some kind of trust a strong foundation in which we can build things from. We can have connection with one another, you know, and and you can then, you know, experience joy with one another. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's uh, seemingly impossible because so few, so few are at that level of consciousness where they can actually, you know, live live that I mean, look at how many Christians there are that are so not Christ-like and it's 
It's amazing. You know, all all of the justifications that go on, rationalizations in people's minds, you know, they're lies. So you don't really get to uh, understand that you lie to yourself until you begin to do that work, you know, to really examine, uh, examine those beliefs that you have. Examine the values that you say that you have. Examine your life, look back, have you lived the values that you speak? Have you lived, you know, those beliefs that you have? And when you do do that, then you get to see, wow, I've lied to myself. I have so lied to myself. And then if you stick with it and really, you know, just try to really be very conscious of yourself and how you are in the world and how you're behaving uh, with others and your reactions and your responses and um, if you are present in life and very conscious you now have the ability to be conscious of how your brain is operating you can catch the lies that that you're still telling yourself. But since now you are at a different level of consciousness, now you know it. And so you can kind of laugh at yourself. And if it's a lie that you told to somebody else, not an outright lie, but you, you weren't able to really capture that lie that you were telling yourself right then, but you were like a day later because you thought about it, then you're able to stand accountable. And then you present as somebody who is trustworthy. So, um, you know, I have been, I have been told my entire life that I'm serious. I have taken life very, very seriously because I did grow up with a family that did not want me, held me in contempt, and it was an awful, awful, awful upbringing, and no child should ever have to experience it completely and utterly alone. No one, no one to go to, no one completely alone. And never did I get any help, even as a child. Clear, clear, it was so clear that I was in need of help. At the ripe old age of five, I entered first grade. I didn't go to kindergarten or nursery school, so I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I was pushed through for 12 years, literally. Failing courses. I had no clue what was going on. There was no help. I was the stupid one, become a teenage alcoholic. All of the signs were right smack out there. No help whatsoever. So then I'm now back in that situation with this family. It's a trip. But um, I'm sorry, I just missed. Um, I have forgotten what I was going to say, and I'm sure it was brilliant. Now, um, geez, I'm sorry. Oh, so you do begin, y you get to be an adult that doesn't know why you're here always on the outside looking in, um, never able to really connect because those kind of connections, that kind of connecting with other people, being able to maintain relationships, all of that comes from the formative years.
the formative years, the mother, essential. And if there's nothing coming from that mother and you are left alone and you don't get that the normal um, mirroring, you know, you don't get the being held close. Um, you're not, there's nothing going on with the mother that is teaching you how to regulate your emotions. Then you do become an adult that you're going to struggle and you are, you are going to be somebody who's going to find it very difficult to connect, maintain relationships. You're going to be a mess. Um, so, I was conscious at a very young age. Sorry for all the yelling, but I was very conscious at a very young age. And um, not, not so much conscious of me so much, but very conscious of, you know, everybody else. And, and I was, sorry, and I was never really in life. I was always outside of life. Always kind of, you know, that hypervigilance um, that comes along with complex PTSD. Yeah, you know, very aware of people coming up from behind me because of the physical abuse and it being so shocking. Um, very aware of my surroundings, which was actually a benefit. It was, it turned out to be good. Um, so, but even though I wasn't ready to accept, okay, you really are unwanted and uh, I I came into AA at 21 years of age so that's when I started doing such serious work to turn everything around and I accomplished that actually and I've been working since I came into AA. My life has been work and I've taken it very, very seriously. And I have always been somebody who's been searching, um, you know, for what this life means. And, you know, because I had a very different life experience than an awful lot of people. Um, I had to. I had to establish for myself a reason to be here. And that reason was, okay, I can't answer these big questions about this life of ours, but I certainly, having gone to so many, you know, twelve step programs, saw that there was an awful lot of people suffering. I lived in New York City, you know, I could see the suffering of all of these people, the homeless. Um, I've never been somebody who's had superficial relationships, so I would really get to know people and and hear them, you know, how they were feeling. So my reason was, all right, this life is going to be a challenge, but there's an awful lot of people hurting, and my reason was to try to be someone who could alleviate some of this hurt, some of the suffering. Now, because of the issues that I had, you know, I certainly did hurt an awful lot of people when you can't really connect, when you can't maintain relationships, then you end up hurting people. So. But that's, you know, so I was faulted for being serious and it's not that I was, 
miserable. I laughed a lot. I have been miserable <laughs> because of um, living these circumstances. But I have been a thinker, and I don't mean that in an egotistical way. Not that I was an intellectual. I have had to think an awful lot about life because I understood somewhere buried in my subconscious that I was completely alone and that came to reality um, for it didn't come to reality for many many years and I can't remember. it was like 2009 actually the first wow I am really alone I have no one um, and then it took a few more years to get oh my god you do come from this girl you come from people who want you dead because you're the one who has the truth and they want you dead because they don't want it exposed but you know what this is my life I get to talk about my experience all of us who have lived similar experiences you get you get to talk about your life see my family go on they live their life and they uh, whatever connection they still have um, if they do I don't know but they get to live a life and because of the actions that they have taken the choices they made I get to live hell and yeah I think about all of the people that I've known that have killed themselves and some I have known 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 and I know different circumstances details different and everything but they were brought up with mothers that used them that abused them no love no care and they did everything that they possibly could and they did make something of their life and then something happened and they got tripped up and they fell into circumstances where they needed help and they couldn't get the help that they needed so they killed themselves and I know for a fact with two of them that they lived something that once dead was never spoken and it pissed me off to listen to you know all of the people who knew them from AA and but didn't really know them never really took the time to know them so why they really did it I understood but everybody was saying well that's what alcoholics do no it actually had nothing to do with that and now the circumstance that I live and the position that I have in my family which is you don't exist um, you're completely abandoned fully outright and then you realize yeah they have done very deliberate things in the hopes that I would finally go homeless like walking on the street or kill myself because that will be the ultimate for my mother I will hand to my mother on a silver platter what she's wanting. See, I feel so oh heartbroken. My daughter Carol killed herself and well she was mentally ill. And I will tell you, I have been hanging on every single day, trying to get my life back, trying to defend against these lies, trying to, you know, recover from the damage done and realizing that yeah what 
those victims of the malignant narcissist say that there's almost no way that you don't have a defense. The lie started an awful long time ago. You didn't realize it. And you've been so isolated from that family that these lies are just accepted by people because they never see you. They have no relationship with you. Even your niece and your nephew, you're kept away from. And then you finally understand why. Because if they actually saw you, they would realize that you are not this violent, mentally ill drunk. So you have to be kept completely away, shunned. Because how you are, it completely goes against the story. And um, yeah, for years now, I have been really trying very, very hard. Hang on, you, you're, you can figure this out. And I've not been able to figure anything out. Now, when you know what I was like, everything I did to accomplish all that I did, and then from 2002, to this day, I've not been able to put the pieces back and people can't figure out something's very wrong here. All right, uh, alcoholic, bulimic, drug addict, uh, bottom of the class, high school, never went to a graduation, started cutting school in first grade, so completely, completely and utterly lost, but then, hmm, got sober, recovered from bulimia, went back to school and started non-matric and then became matric and then got a scholarship to Smith College, graduated with honors, then went to law school, um, passed the bar first time and then became an attorney and then suddenly, what, she becomes lazy? Suddenly, she wants somebody to take care of her when she got no help doing all of that, although the mother claims that she supported her daughter going through school. Oh my God! When I begged both parents for help my first semester of Smith College, I didn't know that on average every class at Smith you gotta buy 10 books and I was taking five classes. I was like, okay, this is gonna cost over like a thousand dollars. I can't even remember. It was or, you know, 80s, but ask my mother just for help to buy the books. Ask your father. Ask my father. Beg him. Even just $20, please, just $20. The guy couldn't even send that. So, please, these lies have been going on my entire life, and some of them are really, wow. Um, so, no, I was never anybody who didn't take personal responsibility, didn't do the work necessary to clean up all of the issues that our parents leave us with, and um, hardly lazy. In fact, my mother has said she's never known someone who has worked as hard, doesn't know a harder worker than moi. But, okay. I have not been able. I have cognitive impairment. And when you have a stroke, you need help. And when you don't get that help, your life can become very unmanageable. And I did everything I possibly could to, you know, keep everything managed. managed. Um, but you forget things. You're disorganized now when you've always been so organized. And yeah, things happen. And uh, But you're so beaten down by this family that is so kicking you, kicking you when you're down, man. When you so desperately need help and support, somebody to care about you and love, well, things get worse. All right. But they trashed everything. Everything. All, everything good about me. All of the work that I did never acknowledged. Never was the stroke acknowledged. Never was the medical issues acknowledged. And all of that I finally did understand. But wow, man, when you're trying to recover from all of this, 
your career is completely destroyed, everything that you've worked on, the dream, everything gone, and you're like, the emotional grief of, like, what the hell is going on? And then you realize that you've been lied to, you know, by these medical people and mental health professionals, and it's like, you're shell-shocked, and then your family is coming after you, and no one is getting it because you didn't have that stroke that left you paralyzed, so you're still you seem okay, but wow, everything's changed now, and the world becomes a really flippy place. But um, you do everything you can to get that life back, and more and more of it is drifting away. You're involved in the manipulations of the malignant narcissist, but you're not getting it then. So that's why I wanted to post these videos to let people understand these are extremely dangerous people. They will not stop at anything, even if it's your own mother. So I've learned a lot. Um, when I got to Anderson, South Carolina, four years ago, perfect storm. Okay, bottomed out. I can't, I can't continue to do this. But I kept hanging on thinking, you did it before. You can do it again. And... I had access to nothing, but all I wanted, all I wanted was to recover just some of that, you know, you don't want to go out as like this violent, mentally ill drunk, but then you start thinking about that and you go, holy shit, you're, you're, you're going to end up dying and the state is going to take care of you <laughs> I don't care anymore but it's there are so many things that go on when you are completely abandoned by your family and you have been so trashed and lied about uh, you are Mr. K Kafka so that's been my life and yeah those of us who have had life experiences that are not, not within that bell curve. So many just kill themselves. And I will tell you that I did an awful lot of work on myself to recover and to deal with all of the issues that I had. And yeah, I am somebody who plows into, you know, the papers, the academic papers, and I found an awful lot of these academic papers uh, and that's where I found wow that's me that's me and I would read how the uh, psychotherapist their treatment for me and then I would put it into practice I would think about the treatment and then I would literally walk it through in life um, but in many of the articles the prognosis not good Many die early from alcoholism, drugs, or killing themselves. So, here I am, still alive. And uh, all of those people who have killed themselves, I'm speaking for all of them. And I do get to speak my story. And you can believe it or not, it doesn't matter much to me at all anymore. But I know that there's a lot of you who are living this similar different circumstances maybe you know your life is a little better and somebody else's life is a little worse but it's uh, it's the kind of life experience that fills you with so much shame that people do not want to talk about it you don't want to say your family doesn't like you you don't want to say your family so thinks that you're just worthless, disgusting, so horrible that they literally don't even want you around, that they've wiped your existence. That's a very hard thing to deal with, very hard to, you know, explain to people why are you in South Carolina? <laughs> and uh, 
why are you living like this? Like, you're, you don't have a home. You, you're living, you know, with just the stuff that you had in the car. Um, so, where is your family? You don't want to answer those questions. But you also can't lie. And then you see the look, and you can tell, oh, they're questioning what I'm saying. And you understand it. Because people have not lived your experience. So they wonder about you. It's, it's a hard road. Um, it's an unfairness that is really, oof, there is no, no good words to explain it. Um, but that's, th this is what you live. So what happened to me? And I know that I'm going on and on, but oh well. Um, it was the weekend just prior to Irma hitting Naples. And I was getting a lot of emails from people who were sending me information. And one email that I got, it was from a Paul Clark. And it didn't even register that it was my brother. I thought it was a subscriber. And, oh, it was after I posted the Helping Those in Need video, or um, oh, trying to connect subscribers with the subscribers who could offer their home uh, because all of the Floridians were evacuating. And I said, I don't have any resources, but I could accommodate one person. Um, so I was getting a lot of people emailing about that in particular. So, you know, I, Paul Clark, and the subject heading is helping those in need. And I was, I open it. And I see Dear Carol, and I read it. I know this is coming from left field, but I'm very moved by your courage and generosity in offering to organize assistance to people in need, despite having no resource yourself. Your beauty and strength inspire me. I'm proud of you. Your brother, Paul. The last email I got from him? was Christmas Eve 2012 when I was homeless living in my car due to the manipulation and it was truly it was kind of like the finale the malignant narcissistic mother her finale after 10 years of doing what she could to document her story, the manipulations, the lies, the never, ever, ever hearing from her for years, 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 years on end when she knows that you are really suffering, that you are so in need of help. And then you get to hear she's going to NAMI. National Alliance for Mental Illness. She's getting support. She's playing the good mother, the daughter, who's just so mentally ill up in Massachusetts. She get pats on the back, playing the good mother, when the reality is she's doing everything to break me. And By 2011 into 2012, my brother and she involved in a very twisted manipulation that got me homeless, living in my car. The circumstances that I live today are due to this man, Paul. And I got this email and I literally, I felt weak at the knees. I was like, okay, 
I have not heard from this guy in five years. The last time I heard was Christmas Eve 2012. He knowing I'm living in my car. And he writes, subject heading, happy birthday, sorry you're suffering. It was the first Christmas Eve that he actually said happy birthday to me. He always got it like a day late or first time was when he got me homeless. He and my mother. And now he's writing happy birthday. Sorry you're suffering. So, he's proud of me. Never mentioned how proud he was when I so became an entirely different human being. Sober, now a productive member of society. No. I guess now, looking back, everything was to break me and make sure that I didn't become a success. Well, I fought like hell, and I did. But they got me when I was vulnerable, so the scapegoat cannot. She cannot change that dynamic. She's got to be a failure. Well, some families can really come after you. Um, so he's proud of me. But look. Uh, despite having no resource yourself. I have nothing because of my family. He knows it. Won't do anything. Oh, they have given money. But I can go into all of the manipulations and then getting, okay, you understand what's going on with the money. And Paul is very twisted when it comes to money. Um, but it's really remarkable. I mean, all of what he has done throughout my adult life, but since 2012. And now he's writing, moved by your courage. Well, Paul, you've known that I've had a lot of courage and, and generosity. Um, in offering to organize assistance to people in need. Your beauty and strength inspire me. Well, Paul, you know I'm really strong to have survived what you guys have done to me. Yeah, I am absolutely strong. That's, I will give you that. You're right. I'll take that. But what what does it say about a man now 63 years old, knowing, has known, has known for a really long time, 17 years, has known. His five year, uh, his younger sister five, of five years has so desperately needed his help, needed his help. And all he could do is keep her down and do things to make sure that everything would be hard. Like when I had to move, when I was moving to Great Barrington, he offered his help. And then the night before the truck was coming in the morning, he called and said he couldn't make it because, well, you know, he was afraid that he might hurt his back. Or um, knowing you know, I was trying to get it through how sick I was, trying to get off those medications and what was happening to my brain, trying to get through to somebody in my family like, this is bad. And all you hear is how self-centered you are and, oh my God. But I have him on the phone and I'm trying, I said, do you, want, do, do you have any knowledge about these medications and the adverse effects? Narcissistic rage screaming, yes, I do. I've helped friends get off it. But you can't ever ask me how I'm doing. And you can't help your sister. So he knew 
I was really sick having to do this move after years of selling everything, just trying to pay the bills, losing health insurance, losing my car insurance. So he pulls out. He's not going to show up to help me move. He knows about the dangers of these medications and he can't acknowledge any of the medical issues that I'm now having to go from specialist to specialist. To God, there were so many things that it was looking back, I think, Jesus, Carol, how did you survive this? Wow. But I did, Paul. And I feel really sorry for you that, you know, like when I was in Michigan and I lost my wallet, two degrees, my car in a dealership. And I'm in a loner car with my two dogs. And my wallet was stolen. And I'm freaking out. Now I, I all of my, my money is in the wallet and my license and, and I'm alone. And I am, you know, I have no one to call, no one where, where to go, and I have no money. I, I had enough for a McDonald's coffee. I was so, the panic that you live when you're alone and now homeless and you have no one. All of the years that I was traveling. So uh, why did I never stop? Because I stopping meant feeling everything. So I drove. But that was that was a panic. Okay. I emailed you, Paul. I emailed Scotty, our mother. I emailed Marie, and I heard nothing back from any of you. No resources, Paul. You fully understand why I have no resources. It was subscribers that I have had to rely on that have picked up the responsibility of the family, opening their doors to me, giving me a place to live for a while, But everything was gone then. And most people don't know that this, this has been going on since 2002. So I'm tired, really tired. And the stress and the, the pain of living this and the desperation and the frustration, because everything's gone. And you have no comfort. There's no comfort left. And you have no money. And people are paying your bills. And, well, those people actually asked you for help. Your, all of your family, your mother has millions, your sister has mega millions, you are very comfortable, and you let, you let someone else do what you should have done. You let my subscriber pay for things. That was absolutely your responsibility, along with everybody in this family. Because if you didn't do the things that you did from 2002 to 2017, if I actually did get the help that I needed early on, none of this would have happened. None of it. So you destroyed your sister's life. And then you let somebody else foot the bill to keep her alive. What does that what does that feel like? I can't imagine what that could possibly feel like. I mean, how did, how does one do this to their own sister? 
but to know that your sister has no one and she's completely alone and her life has now just been utterly destroyed and you know that she had a stroke and she can't figure things out and well you know because she actually told you the details what she needed never got how necessary it was to have some some help managing the practical especially with the finances how many times did I say the money that you are giving me is a waste because well then you get to see that it was purposeful how it was delivered and all of all of it and you think to yourself they they just keep beating you down claiming that you're so worthless because you need help but they will never give you the help that you need that you've been asking for and then you get ah you really get when they can't even respond to knowing that now you're in Michigan it's two degrees out you have nowhere to go your car is in the dealership and your wallet is gone you know that oh Jesus now they they do want you dead you had all of the signs before but you weren't able to really grasp it because who wants to believe that their own mother and brother and sister want them dead it's hard very painful very painful so you know the last I hear from you is after you got me homeless happy birthday Carol sorry you're suffering as subject heading me um, email it's like wow okay that was five years ago but now you're proud of me and you know I have nothing you're proud my beauty my strength my courage generosity I have so often thought about what it must be like to be someone who could leave someone completely alone and just go on about their life and you know they have no one you know that yeah they're suffering this is not an exaggeration this is not me being a drama queen now they are suffering and you walk away See, I, never, I, I, I have not ever been able to do that. In fact, I stayed in relationships because I thought the person was alone and didn't have any friends. It was a housemate that I allowed to live for years because I could never put somebody out that had no one. Not that they couldn't financially handle it. So I knew later on that okay you have issues with with you know being alone you know what it feels like and you never want anybody to experience that hell all of the times that you broke up from girlfriends and Marie broke up from boyfriends I thought that you were alone God remember me calling and I was so upset but I have put you in my shoes and me in yours I've tried to figure out for 15 years 15 years you've been at this and what could make somebody do this how could a brother leave his younger sister completely and utterly alone knowing she's got medical issues knowing she's getting older has no one it's not anything that I can I, I will ever be able to understand but then to shoot that email off call um, I'm sorry to tell you 
that 58 years and you've never said that you were proud of me for anything. So I'm living an incredibly painful life now, Paul. And that's due to you. Do you really think that I care? That you are proud of me? <laughs> this is remarkable. It is truly um, so, wow. It couldn't be more narcissistic. I have said several times in videos that my family is monitoring my channel. Well, they are. They want to make sure that I never, ever, ever speak what I just did. But this is my life. And uh, those of you who feel that, and I've been told by other people, well, if you post any videos on narcissism, make sure that you post them when you're happy because you know that the narcissist feed off of you know, their victims suffering. I'm not going to be controlled by anybody. This is my life. This is the reality. This is the truth. And that's it. And whether I am happy or not, um, nobody's going to dictate when I get to speak. So, I don't let the narcissist control me anymore. They don't control me. So, um, I get to speak however I am. And no, I did get really bad. And if I went into all of the details, maybe, maybe somebody could understand that I have been brought down. And to live every single day frustrated, so stressed beyond belief, desperation, not being able to figure things out, face judgment from an awful lot of people, it ruins you. It's so unbelievably, it's exhausting and it, it put, it, it, you're in shell shock, you were in shell shock years ago, but it's kind of permanent and it's an overwhelm and an overload and you can't take on, you know, very much new information without really working it to understand and you start changing when you live without a life everything that you've known is gone and you can't get in anything back so you sit in this little box of an apartment all you have is your computer that's it all the places that you go you can't create a life without any help, without any resources, without... Yeah, you're talking to somebody who who did a 180 on my life. You're talking to somebody who... Yeah, Paul, I was the stupid one, right? So you could never, ever say that you were proud of me graduating from Smith. Or Remember that Mother's Day, the first year that I was done? God, going to Marie's? First year, done, Smith College. Oh my God, I, wow. I was completely a new person. I was no longer the stupid troublemaker. I was sober. And I finished my first year making Dean's List. And because I was older, it was kind of, but, but, wow, what a remarkable turnaround, huh, for the stupid one. And I met you in the World Trade Center to take the PATH train over to Marie's. And you grunted hello. And you literally did not say anything to me. You ignored me. You sat far away from me playing your guitar 
And I was looking at you and I thought, okay, I had no, I was so unbelievably stunned, shocked, and trying to understand, as I have throughout my entire life, just trying to understand this family. But how is it? You couldn't even say, so how was your first year at Smith? Nothing? You ignored me on the platform waiting for the path train. You ignored me on the train sitting away from me. And then when we were waiting for like an hour for Marie to show up to pick us up, it was Sunday, we're sitting outside, now on the New Jersey side, and you sit across the street playing your guitar, still not talking to me at all, like I'm nothing, like I wasn't even there, like I didn't exist. Marie comes, picks us up, you sit in the front, I sit in the back. Marie is like an hour, hour and a half late. She doesn't even apologize. She says hello, asks me nothing about Smith. I sit in the back and you and Marie talk. You talk to Marie. You won't even acknowledge my presence. But then you became vicious later on in life. Then it wasn't just ignoring. Then it was happy birthday, sorry you're suffering. The call. Well, since you're part of the family, I thought you might like to know Dad died. Marie and I are off to Scotland. Bye. You put it in my face every chance you got for 15 years that I was nothing. And if I was something, I was horrible. The things that you have done. See, I do believe that this idea of not airing our dirty laundry or remaining silent, I absolutely do believe that that allows people to treat people the way you treated me all my life. And I, I have no, I don't have hatred for you. I don't have any bad feelings for you, actually. I feel so deeply sorry for you to think that the damage done to you left you somebody who's very sadistic, who likes to hurt people. I can't imagine having to live that life. And really, for no reason, other than you're the flying monkey of the malignant narcissist, and, and also, yeah, money, 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 money. Perfect. You, Kate, you want that money from mom when she's dead. You want it all. So, um, I can't imagine living what you've lived. And look, you get it after 15 years, guys, that they do want you dead. And uh, but, but, you know, staying silent, not talking about this kind of stuff, first of all, those of us who are the scapegoats of these kinds of families. It's very, very hard to talk about this, but it's necessary. You did nothing wrong. And I know the shame that comes about from being treated this way. And the shame kind of keeps us locked up. And then we go off and we pretend in the world that we're okay. And I'm not going to do that. 
I'm never going to do that again. And if my life can mean anything to anyone, then this is how it's going to mean something. By my speaking out for all of the children who are being abused and neglected <laughs> and should not be, by my saying that parenting is really pretty bad in this country, but to have grown up in these kinds of families, this needs to be exposed. No child should ever come into the world unwanted and truly have to face cruelty from all of those in their family. And it's unfortunate that you are incapable of ever um, really working through the issues that you were left with. Marie, incapable. But what you did to me was wrong. It was so wrong. And tragically wrong, actually. So I guess I'm using my voice now to speak for those who have had a similar experience. You've left me feeling like I don't even have a right to exist. That's at my core. And at my core is this unwantedness. And at my core is that I'm nothing. Now, intellectually, I know that that's not true. And what you've done, I finally was able to not take it personally. But man, do I feel it personally. And yeah, you, you have put me in a position where, OK, it's a challenge to live every single day. And you may ultimately get what you've all wanted. And that is, that's the reality of my life. But you probably will be able to maintain the lie. And you'll be able to say, oh, oh my god, oh, I feel so bad. Yeah, because Wow, are you ever gentle around people? And you are cruel and vicious when no one is around. So you'll do the act. You'll pretend how upset you are. And you might even cry. And then you'll claim, yeah, she was really mentally ill. Well. As long as YouTube is here, you know, I guess this is the only avenue that I have left to try to um, maintain some of who I was and who I still am. And, uh, but it's unfortunate because you know what? <laughs> All of the lying in our family put me on the road. It put me on the road to get right here, to be speaking the truth on YouTube. Isn't that interesting? The thing that you all hate and you've got, or Kate, you, whoever is monitoring, Kate probably, all of my videos. I've wondered if Marie has a YouTube person that money of hers allows her to do an awful lot. But yeah, she a techie. She could absolutely have somebody at YouTube monitoring my videos because she really doesn't want the truth. But um, it's fascinating to think how you so want me dead so I don't speak the truth, but you were the ones who put me on this road. Isn't it ironic? Um, anyway, yeah, I have trouble with my brain. I have trouble with memory. I'm growing older, Paul, and I get to do it all alone and realize I have a family that just 
So doesn't even care. So doesn't care that they can't even manage to do the right thing for themselves. That was the shocker years ago. That was the real like, okay. Um, now I've heard you know people in families, uh, sisters, brothers, when the brother or sister is in need of help, all the family discord, friends, you know, they show up. And very often, this is what I've heard. Well, you know, I I don't particularly like him. We don't get along, but I knew that I had to do what was right for me. You guys don't even have that. You have the opposite. I don't even know. Did you... Do you, do you know I called Kate? I called Kate. She was the last call to family, begging for help. And I, I said, I can't do this anymore. And I know that I'm going to have to put my dogs down. I can't, please, nothing. And you know, dogs were everything to me. No, you guys don't stop. You have no limit. Nothing will stop you ever. So, this is what I live, all right? Uh, you've made your choices, and I have made mine. And um, I've gone on and on, but you know what? It's a shock. It's a real shock to get that email from you. But I know what you're doing, and I know what this family has done, and yeah, you don't get to do it without me speaking the truth about what you're doing. So, sorry that you have become who you are, and it's interesting because as worthless as I have felt, all of the shame that I have felt and the stress of living this nonstop falling you know backwards and here in this book he talks about chronic stress leads to a regression and issues of mind came back and then more shame and oh my god but no matter how horrible I have felt about myself, I feel about myself, not understanding why everything I tried failed, not understanding that what the hell is going on. Um, I respect me. I really respect me because I know I know everything that I've done. I know that I never stopped. That I kept going. That I tried. That I kept trying to figure out how to get beyond a circumstance that for so many different reasons I, the circumstances just kept getting worse. I have continued on facing so many people with their judgment being betrayed by so many people because of their lies falling into all these different places all over the country and knowing my god there's nothing here for me and then when you say that people think that you're lying that you just don't want to create another life. And they don't know how destroyed you are inside, how broken you are now. And it's because of you and Marie and Scotty, who I can no longer call mom. I don't thank you for this, Paul. Because now, 
<clears throat> I fully understand that there's always something twisted behind it. So, you guys who are dealing with your families, it is so tragic that any of us have to live this. So unbelievably tragic that I and you do find yourself alone because you do end up with an awful lot of people who they can't understand and I will tell you that do not talk to people who have lived what you've lived if they haven't don't don't even if they seem to understand eventually eventually it's gonna come right back at you you get into it with a friend you call them out for something that they've done like lying and they continue to lie if they can't look at themselves if they can't take responsibility they will come after you viciously and use against you what you have confided in them it can actually be dangerous to talk to people who don't have this kind of experience and then even when talking to people with this kind of experience our experiences diverge they, they um, we all have unique experiences with these malignant narcissists so just because somebody else has a malignant narcissist does not mean that they have exactly the same experience. Do you know how many people that I have spoken to who have the malignant narcissistic mother but they're still their their families intact. They claim to experience what I've experienced watching me drive around the country uh, knowing that my family has completely abandoned me knowing how much I have lost knowing some of the details of my life and they claim that they're living the same experience and then you get to know sometimes you're living with them and then you hear them talking on the phone with their brother and their sister and and their mother calling and they're going to uh, visit their family on the holidays and they just got inheritance and and they have their life and they're in in a portion of the country where they know they belong so those of you who have a different experience than a lot of even those who have the malignant narcissistic mother there's going to be differences and depending on those differences there could be tension there can be judgment even from those who've grown up with malignant narcissists it's unfortunate you know the severity of what they do to us we long for understanding we long to somehow tell our story and be believed and we so want to repair the damage that they've done they are making us out to be something that we are so not but we've got to live this and then you hear from all of these people who have never lived anything close to it saying oh just forget about it make make somebody else your family make us here on YouTube your family and it's those who have some family family that say it you know they don't understand complete and utter abandonment and they think it's easy to replace you don't replace family but anyway um, so for those of you who are dealing with the consequences of the malignant narcissist I'm gonna leave you with this 
take them very seriously and do the work necessary do re do research find out their characteristics the gaslighting the lying the uh, use of flying monkeys the communication that they use Paul my god wow your communication yeah like being on acid trying to talk to you and then when you're so sick and you're listening to all of the insane 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 oh my god over the top you have a hundred and what two fever I was so sick I remember the idiocy of what you were saying and then finally I just got so mad and ooh, Carol's mad She's the angry one. You guys are flipping so filled with rage. Anyway, that rage can. It's a good um, indication. Of when you finally get at the point where you are screaming at somebody, if that happens, you know, several times, then that should be a sign that something's wrong in the relationship and you've got to walk away. Um, if somebody just continues to lie to you, and they will not ever take responsibility and then they start saying insane things walk away walk away because if it goes on and on you know it's not going to get any better and they will just cause utter madness and they will make you feel like your family makes you feel and they can be dangerous too Unfortunately, we do now live in a world where people are, you really have to see the signs, you know, and pay attention to the signs and the red flags and, um, and respect them and act accordingly. So if you are somebody who has done some work and you see people who are saying things and they're not living what they're saying, they're disintegrated, walk away. If you hear people lying and you call them out and they can't say, you know what, you're right, let me take a look at this, let's, you know, I'm sorry, and, you know, they're calling you a precious friend and all of that kind of stuff, but they won't do that and they'll keep lying and they know how desperate you are for the truth, they keep lying, walk away because you know that that person doesn't care about you. If they cared, they'd stop lying. Um, especially when they know that your life has been destroyed by lies. If you see people who are demonstrating a lack of care for what is taking place in our country and or lack of care for what you are talking about. They say, well, look, you know, you just got to forget about that and, you know, get over it and, or say those very caring things. Well, you know what? Your life is your life and you really need to just focus on your life and stop. Don't even give them any energy or time. Or, but you're trying to work something through. Don't, don't go back and try to talk to them because they'll do it time and time again. They just don't want to hear it is essentially what they're saying. Um, I will tell you, you know, that of the people that I have met who are awake, who know what is going on, there's an awful lot of people out there that have their issues and they will not work on them. 
If they're comfortable, they will not work on them. And they will continue to hurt you. They will continue to behave in ways that will hurt you, betray you, and then if you try to resolve it, um, if, if they are of a consciousness and a maturity, they have that kind of, you know, they're above taking the low road, they will be able to admit what they have done. They will be able to talk about it. They will be able to communicate on a level where it can be resolved. And those are the people that you want in your life. Those are the people who are demonstrating to you that you're worth the work. That you're worth taking responsibility. All of the other people, not saying that they're horrible or whatever, I'm just saying that they are at a low level of consciousness and they are ego driven, they're about themselves. Doesn't matter, does not matter how nice they are or all the things they give you or whatever, they're still at a low level of consciousness and the relationship is about them. You, you cannot have an equal, equal relationship with people at a low level of consciousness where they are very ego driven and that is unfortunately the majority of the com of the country and when people are comfortable they don't do anything um, we do have a very kind of apathetic lazy people on the whole um, they don't care about their own maturity they don't care about their own personal growth they don't care about consciousness they only care about their own comfort every single day um, that's it. So, it's tricky when you come from these families. It's very, very hard to kind of navigate life. Um, and I think many of us actually are left with this default of trust, which is really, well, Deep trust, I don't have. You know, I can trust on a certain level. I can't trust that you like me, that you really care about me, or uh, lovable, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, what people say to me, I trust that what they're telling me, unless they give indications that they're absolutely lying, but I do trust people. So that has never really been damaged. When they start lying to you, that's when they start putting everything into question. That's when you have to question everything that they say. But if they will not attend to those lies, I'm telling you, you've got to walk away. Because they will really. If you see somebody who cannot take responsibility, who's really defensive, and, and suddenly they start saying things that are really kind of off the wall. They then can be somebody who's quite dangerous for you. So it's uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do in order to maintain and go on and try, you know, to have some joy and to try to have you know, meaningful relationships in, in the world that we're living today. It's almost impossible. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a joke in terms of the condition of the American people on the whole. Because everything is about superficial and material and consumerism and cell phones and ugh. But, um, and I'm sure that I could have that kind of relationship with so many of my subscribers. So why the hell are you not here in my real life? But so many of us are alone now. And I, I know the loneliness. I know the aloneness. And it's very hard. It has a tremendous effect, not just on how we feel emotionally, but physically, spiritually. 
mentally. How we treat one another is absolutely 100% essential that we do not lie to one another, that we do not play games with one another, that we do not manipulate one another, that we are honest because anything outside of that is going to cause harm and it is usually the one who's most vulnerable who gets hurt. Those who are still comfortable, well, they, could, they don't care. You know, they go on, they're fine. They've got their life. Um, so, anyway, I had to get this out. Um, I wish that I could do something to help you feel better, all of you. Um, for every child who's abused and neglected, every adult, you know, who has to work through all of these issues, every adult who now needs help, my, I, my heart goes out to you. I know what it feels like. And it is, it has left me shell-shocked, permanent. And that's what I deal with a lot, you know. To, to, to recognize the level of contempt or hatred that they claim that you are filled with. Wow. Okay. But I have seen other people's videos, they talking about their personal experiences, and it has so helped me. So that's one of the reasons why I'm posting this. This one went really long, and I am sorry, but you know what? Um, I needed it. I needed to talk. When you live this kind of gaslighting and all of it, it makes your life so surreal. And sometimes just talking helps you process. You know, that email from my brother was like, okay, uh, writing, write out your experiences. God, how much writing did I do? It helped me process what was taking place. Spend quiet time really reflecting on the experiences that you are having and we know we just know intuitively what a healthy relationship is and what a not healthy relationship is and so you want the healthy relationship you can very easily when you know when you really think about how you're being treated you know that if you're not being treated well then you're with somebody who's unhealthy and if they can't take a look at themselves leave them you know because they're not it's not going to get better um, understand the gaslighting and how they can really wow it is remarkable what they can do now my mother is really good, but my brother is really unbelievable. You know, the, the it was like every single interaction with this guy left me like, what the hell? Always pointing the finger. It's you. It's you. All of the times, you know, the I'll help you move and then calling and canceling. I mean, that I could go on. There's a whole list of that. But he agreeing with, you know, my mother's story and you can't quite comprehend how Paul you know I'm sober Paul I 
I had your wife speak at an AA meeting. You know I've been sober. And then they just stare. You know, that nothing. It's like when you present reality, they like zone away, which is a really weird thing. I never even knew what to do with it. I just sat looking like, is he still here? Trying to think of all the other stuff, but I can't. Um, not right now. My brain is. It's really um, when you when you have a stroke, when your career is destroyed, and then you have this family. Oh my God! It creates for you no possibility of recovering. But then having to understand what the hell they're doing. It's overwhelm, it's overload, it's so much stress, and all you just friggin' needed was just some help. Because you've always been somebody who, yeah, was incredibly strong and never stopped, never, ever stopped to try to get out of circumstances. So you know, Paul, mom claiming I am the hardest worker she's ever seen. And, and you know everything that I've done. So the truth is buried in you, and it may be right there, you know, you might be very conscious of it and just not care. But you you knew everything I did. Everything I did. And you have also known that you, Mom and Marie, did everything you did to make sure that I would never succeed again. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting very tired now, and I'm going to post this on my backup channel because I got a copyright strike. So I only have 15 minutes. So, um, leave questions if you'd like me to answer them. If you want me to address certain subjects, please um, post them. This was more a uh, uh, rather, you know, I'm just kind of speaking heart and mind. That email from my brother really threw me. It hurts. The guy knows I have no resources. They've been watching my videos, knowing how, how bad I got. They watched my videos when I was living in my car. I had nowhere to go. I had no one completely alone. This is this is one hell of a messed up family. Um, so when you get that kind of email, I'm proud of you. And yet he knows I have nothing and he still still can't do anything. It's, wow. So um, I would much prefer to actually address comments or address questions. It's easier for me to do that than have to organize um, and then present. I can't do it anymore because that requires an awful lot of effort. And unfortunately, I'm not well, you know, so I'm doing the best that I can. And um, so I do want you. Um, If I can be of assistance to any of you, if I can be of help, you know, to help you understand um, some of your life experience, and if I can, if I can, you know, in my talking about my experience, um, if it at least lets you feel less alone and maybe feel a little better, then I'm here. Okay, so.
leave comments and let me know. And one of the things that helps us to get through the shame that we carry, it's not because we're bad, it's because we've been, wow, showered with so many experiences of the people that are supposed to love you. And they, because of the lies, yeah, you do, you do now carry an awful lot of shame and very, very hard to deal with. Um, don't ever let anybody silence you. If somebody says, hey, put that in the past, get away from them. They're not going to be of help to you. They're not going to be of support to you. If anybody says, um, well, just forget them, or you know all of the stuff that people say, don't air your dark, dirty laundry, you're a victim, get over it, um, uh, whatever else they say, walk away from them. They are walking the low road. They have a very low consciousness. Um, you're not going to get better with these kinds of people. You need to find people who fully understand and very important to find people who have done the work and have raised their consciousness so that you can hear from them and uh, and they're not going to push you away. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to you know use all of that language that so silences us and then leaves us feeling more shame. Thank you very much. This is the most important work that you will ever do in your life. Getting to the bottom of this. Ridding yourself of the issues that you were handed by the malignant narcissist and the narcissistic siblings and and getting to who you really are. And I can't say that you'll be cured because I don't think any of us are. I think the best that we can do is deal with the issues that prevent us from accomplishing what we want to do in life and we can live a decent life. We don't have to, you know, be, um, you know, the drug addict and the alcoholic and, and uh, live the trajectory of the, the, scapegoat that the malignant narcissist puts us on, we can change an awful lot. But I think that if you did experience the kind of hatred and contempt that my mother had for my life, then your formative years were really messed up. And you probably have a lot of issues relating to that. Um, even those issues can be worked on. Will you be cured and suddenly find yourself Oh, happy and joyful and, you know, no. Because a lot of that is permanent, unfortunately, because you don't have a foundation, a healthy foundation. You've been given the kind of foundation that really, well, leaves your life kind of messed up. Um, leaves you, you know, incapable of trusting people or um, there's a myriad of issues, however one manifests such issues. You know, the unwantedness never ever went away. Now, did that mean that I couldn't have relationships? Absolutely not. It did motivate me in many, many ways. Um, it kind of, I didn't understand it, you know, before I really took a look at it, but I was kind of motivated to jump out of relationships for fear that I might at some point, you know, feel this person not wanting me. So I moved around a lot. I got to know a lot of people, um, but my difficulty maintaining relationships. Um, when, you, when you're not given a foundation of connection, then it's very hard to connect. And it was very, very hard for me to stay in relationship. And I did work on that. And I was able to have incredible friends for about 10 years.
and then the crisis and the stroke and the medications and um, so many of us have attachment disorders because of you know the um, being brought into the world with a mother who is incredibly cold and does not do you know the, the normal um, things that a mother would do you know there are mothers who have no maternal instinct at all at all so um, there are mothers who hate you know their baby they put on them you know that they're a burden and when that that is your formative years you're gonna have a lot of difficulty having a healthy relationship um, knowing what it means when you are treated horribly you know and you're never treated with any kind of respect or love or care or that could frighten you actually when you get older and you know it actually disgusted me when people really liked me and loved me how twisted is that I had internalized my mother's contempt for me so if anybody loved me and really liked me I then soon after had discussed for them because how could you love something that is contemptuous you gotta work all of that out and you can it takes an awful lot of work but the uh, attachment issues I say disorder because I guess that's what it's called but um, there are variations you know of attachment issues um, I could certainly discuss that I can discuss complex PTSD But I do suggest that everybody, if you have not gotten this book, this became my Bible, as you can see. It's really very, very old. Very, very old, falling apart. Sorry, I'm not in the camera. Um, People of the Lies got there. It gave me a real understanding. I had to read it many, many times over. Um, so, and I do think, especially now, when all of these agendas are really taking off and they're accelerating, um, knowing who you are is essential to standing firm and not living a life of fear. You know, for the longest time I didn't understand what what Mark Passio would say. You're either living, you're either living love or you're living fear. And I, for the longest time, thought about that. What does that mean? And I finally got it. When you raise your consciousness, you begin to live love. Now, I'm not talking about the sentimental I'm not talking about the gushy. I'm not talking about um, the bullshit that a lot of people speak. Love you, love you. Um, I'm talking about the real stuff. And very often that can look like not love. It can look like anger. It can look like um, so direct and straightforward that one would miss it as love. But my love of truth, I finally understood it. I so much love truth that those people in my life that I really care about, I want them to grow. I want them to mature. I want them to get to their authentic self. And I will do everything I can and sometimes it'll, it will cause an awful lot, you know, of chaos or whatever, um, friction, and eventually 
I then just have to stop when it's clear that they're not going to do anything. Um, I understand the seriousness about relationships. Now, when I call somebody a friend, they are a friend. And that means I've taken on a responsibility and an obligation towards that person. But it's not just about having fun. I, the people that I respect in my life are the ones that called me out of my shit. And the ones that I learned from. The ones that were really helping me on this road to discover who I was. Giving me the books and... Um, those are the people that cared. Those are the people that I really respect. Uh, I don't respect all of the people in my life that just wanted to have fun. Um, so I do consider that friendship is about having good times and all that kind of stuff, but it's also about growing. So if you really call somebody a friend and you really care about them and maybe love them, then you hand them a gift when you call them out on their issues and when you try to have conversations you know about consciousness and working on those issues so that you can grow and your relationship can be stronger and all of that when they don't want that gift uh, yeah it's hard it hurts but you do have to walk away but that's what friendship means you know, and so I guess, you know, so many people have left comments like, don't be scared. Don't, I'm not scared. I am not scared. But I know an awful lot of people are. And when you finally do understand the difference between you're either living in a, like a consciousness of love or living a consciousness of fear. It's not that you're shivering in your boots all the time, but you're running, you're running every day. You're running from you, you're running from the truth, you're running, you know, and you just keep doing the same thing and you're comfortable and you're going along and it's fine, but you don't want, you never want to get to, you know, anything that really uh, is painful or, you know, kind of puts a, um, wrench in your comfort for a while, um, you're going to constantly be living fear. When you do the work necessary, you get a lot stronger. And when you really do raise your consciousness, you go, wow, what a difference. Okay, that's when everything becomes genuine. That's when things become real. And that's when you go, oh my God, I lived that long living that pretense, thinking, thinking things about me that were not true. It wasn't true until you get to that higher consciousness and you see the difference. Wow. You get the difference between talking about how compassionate you are and how you care to, oh my God, you, you well up with the compassion that happens naturally in your life. And the care is generative. You cannot not act on that which you care about. You have to act. It compels you to act. So you get an awful lot of people talking how much they care even in the awake crowd, but they don't. Not until that becomes a generative force. And Mark Passio talks about how ger care must become generative for it to be real. And you can only get there if you do the work necessary to raise your consciousness. Um, and, and when you do raise your consciousness and you get that so many are on a lower level and you go, Jesus, because you want the people that you care about, you want what they say to you to be true. You want them to be people that when they speak, they actually will do. Um, that they honor their word and they know their word, more importantly. Um, they know themselves so they can speak who they are 
instead of speaking all this bullshit that they're believing, but then you get to know, oh, Jesus, they're not who they claim to be. Um, and you want them to be at that that higher level of consciousness because you know it's there that people speak the truth. You know it's there that they're actually, well, living, not fear, but love. You know it's there that they're not acting just to get your approval. And they're not living a pretense and they're not afraid to be abandoned. Although they know it's going to really hurt, but but that they've become someone that you don't have to guess any longer. You don't have to be hurt any longer. You know it's at that level that you're not going to be betrayed because they have found out who they are so they can speak who they are and you can know who they are. And then you can make choices about who they are. We, we live in a world where people don't know, so they just throw things at you and you get to see God. It's a mess. So it's very hard when those you care about don't care enough about you. to even just stop lying and pretending and um, it's at that level of higher consciousness that and I'm not saying I'm at a very high level so it's not that just bumped myself up to know there are so many different levels. There's this this kind of work never stops. Um, but that's when the love of truth got you. And there's no going back. And it can be a hard road because if there's no going back it means all of those liberal progressive friends, there's no going back. And when you finally realize that all of the people who have lied to you, there's no going back. There might be going back if they decide to finally do the work necessary to clean themselves up and and not and not do that. Okay, that's fine. But you realize that it becomes a narrow road. Yes, like it says in the Bible. Very narrow. And it doesn't leave you very many choices. Because the choices that you used to have are no longer available. You're on the straight road now. And truth is everything. And you can intermingle that with, you know, or interchange truth with love or God because all three are the same and you get to hear how many people talk about God and you know that they're not really living all of what they believe so it we, we it's really unfortunate but I have got to the point where I know that this is what I have to do and this is what I'm going to do and I'll do everything that I can until the fat lady sings for to help to you know alert to inform whatever but this is this is all I can do now and I um, I have forgotten what I was going to say. So, how long have I talked? <gasps> Two hours and thirty minutes. All right. Well, this is being posted on my backup channel. Um, got it.
I guess I really needed to process an awful lot. Paul, man. It says 63 years old and you're going to let your sister die. And you are not going to do a thing. You actually got her here. How sad. How sad is that? Now, I wish we could all find a community where we could all live. Wouldn't that be great? I wish I could make it happen. You guys absolutely keep me going. You have no idea. So many of you leave comments or messages and you say, I'm sorry for going on and on. No. No. I need you as much as you need me. Okay? It's working both ways. And I think that's what a healthy relationship is based on. Um, thank you. Have a great weekend.